This show is part of the RetroZap.com podcast network. This is what you can look forward to on a very ducktastic episode 131 of Skywalking Through Neverland. Across a sea of stars, look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. No, it's a duck. They call him Howard the Duck. No way to conceal it. In the feathers touch, I love him apart. It starts off with two naked ducks. We go from ducks to sharks. Wait a minute, weren't those rivals in West Side Story? Remember, never land in a shark noodle. Hey, everybody, this is Jedi Schwa. And this is Shaz Bazaar from Techno Retro Dads saying, Never, Never land, land on Duck, Duck World. World. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Hello, Skywalkers. Listen. I only hope that we never lose sight of one thing that was all started by a mouse. You are skywalking through Neverland. Hey, Skywalkers. Welcome to Skywalking Skywalking Through through Neverland. Neverland. We are the family-friendly Disney and Star Wars podcast that brings you entertaining stories from creators and fans. We want to give a big thank you to our family of Skywalkers out there who help us out on each and every show, whether it's just listening, posting on our Facebook group, or spreading and sharing the positivity about our adventure through fandom. I am Richard, and now everyone please say hello to the hardest working woman in show business, my sweetie wife Sarah. That's me! Yay! I I spent all night putting together crafts, and then today we had a craft workshop, and it was really fun. And yeah, we're just busy, busy bees this summer. But that's how we like it. This summer cannot end soon enough. (laughs) It is how we like it, though. Well, Skywalkers, thank you so much for joining us every show and on social media throughout the week. I know several of you tweet at us during the week at Skywalking Pod. We love that when you do that. And also, you are a tweet walker when you do that. So who doesn't want to be a tweet walker? I'd love to, but I don't understand it. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, you even have a Twitter account at Sith Rich. So everyone bombard at Sith Rich yeah, and say But if I don't answer back, don't take it personally. <laughs> I do check my Twitter account once every season. It's true. Well, I tell them all that you tweet, so it's okay. <laughs> you can tweet to at Skywalking Pod. It's all good. So I'm not a tweet walker. I'm a scope walker. I'm a scope walker like these guys right over a here. A scope walker like everyone on Periscope who is watching us. And you also are great on Facebook. You post you in go. our Facebook group. I post like a fiend on mm-hmm. Facebook. You're excellent. So there you go. All right, now we are recording this from Long Beach, California on August the 3rd, 2016. And uh, quite a few things happened in, in Star Wars history on this date. Well, Corey Burton was born back in 1955, so he turns 61 today. 61 today. I'm going to pretend I did all that math in my head when it wasn't written right here. Oh, I, I didn't notice you cheated. <laughs> So, happy birthday to Corey, and thank you very much for recording a little soundbite for our Skywalking Through Neverland intro. And also, this day, back in 1978, this is when R2 and 3PO and Darth Vader, they put their footprints at the Man's Chinese Theater right there in the forecourt. Wait, so do you put your handprints and footprints on Darth Vader and R2 and C-3PO's feet? Well, they don't have their handprints in there, right. just, just their footprints. You know what I do? What do you do? I put my hand in Han Solo's handprints. I mean Harrison Ford's handprints. Yeah, to the upper right, <laughs> you'll see Harrison Ford, and next to that is George Lucas. Mm-hmm. So, he has tiny, George Lucas has about my size hands, which is tiny. Yeah. Scope walkers, hands. do you guys ever go to the Man's Chinese Theater and see the Star Wars footprints? Yeah, uh, Lady Hanna Solo says she has the same size hands as George <laughs> Lucas. He has small hands. Yes, you agree with me, Lady Hanna Solo. We love that. Oh, I was going to ask you a question. Some some people on Periscope were were posting instead of hearts, it was coming up as as photos. What, photos. What like little photo things? Do you guys know what that means? Is someone taking a screenshot or something? Oh, they're uh, taking pics. 
I don't know. But the more we go on this, the more editing I have to I do. I know. I'm sorry. So before we go on to the big show, we have a couple of thank yous. We're going to thank Martin Keeler, who was the, one of the organizers for Hashtag Cantina at Star Wars Celebration Europe. We had him on the show right before the big event. So he sent us a care package. Oh, that's right. He sent us some posters, Hashtag Cantina, a keychain button bottle opener, Cantina guitar picks. Yeah, you know what? This, which are awesome. And a t-shirt. And a t-shirt. You know what? Now that I have these guitar picks, I think I want to pick up the guitar again and maybe in September practice it. It's oh. one of those things I, I practiced, practiced, and put down 10 years later. I'm going to pick it back up again. Aw. <laughs> Yay. So that's, that'll be my inspiration. And we also want to give a big thank you to Trisha Barr. Absolutely. She yeah. sent a little care package too. She sent a pen that says Celebration Europe on it, mm-hmm. a couple of Jedi News patches. Oh, they were so cool. Some stickers. Yeah, and also uh, what she got for the fangirl, she got the new fangirl loot crate box, which has a bunch of stuff from her universe and kind of divided it up into us fangirls from Fangirls Going Rogue. So I got this awesome coloring book that is illustrated by Katie Andrews, and also, uh, you know, is is her universe press, which is really awesome. And Teresa got the dress, which has Women of Marvel on it. And I think there was a handbag as well. And it was really neat. Really good stuff. So thank you to Martin and thank you to Trisha. Yeah. We love the gifts. Absolutely. All right. Now, before we tell you what's coming up on this big show, let's reveal the winner of the Foreign Dub Contest. Dun, dun, dun. But first, let's go ahead and hear that clip one more time. The first person that guessed the film, scene, and language is... Franklin Taylor! Franklin Taylor. He was the first one to guess that it was Star Wars. It was the scene where the guy who runs Princess Leia's ship is choked and... It was in Japanese. Mm-hmm. So he, I asked for all three things. Some people would just send in two answers. Oh, okay. Even if they were first, they didn't win. So the first person to answer all three questions was Franklin Taylor. So good job, Franklin. Now, here's the scene in English. Where are those transmissions you intercepted? What have you done with those plans? We intercepted no transmissions. Uh, uh, this is a consular ship. We're on a... And now let's mash them up together again. This is what it sounds like when you mash English and Japanese. <laughs> now let's talk about what's going on with today's show. Oh, I'm so excited about this. Yay. We are going to celebrate the greatest film of all time. What? That featured a dog from outer space. Okay. Leah Thompson's big hair. <laughs> Tim Robbins talking like a duck. <laughs> and the greatest rock song by Thomas Dolby. This could only be. Howard the Duck. We talk about the high points, what went wrong, and the possible future for Howard. And we do it with the only team. That could appreciate this 1986 cinematic gem, the techno retro dads themselves, Jedi Schwa and Shaz Bazaar. Awesome talk. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. <laughs> I love me some Howard. 
Now, from there we go from ducks to sharks. The greatest rivals in the West Side Story. No, that was, no, no, that no. was the Jets. That, that was, was the Jets, Jets and the you Sharks. Sure? You know what? Can you ask Siri? Oh, no, I know this. Oh, I'm up on my West Side Story. Siri, who were the rivals in West Side Story? Okay, give me a moment. <laughs> Here's what I found on the web for War of the Rivals in West Side Story. All right. Matt I, Clifton says Sharks and Jets. See? there. Oh, well. Matt Clifton is our Siri. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Well, me and my Talking Apes TV co-host, Mark Gushiewicz, we review the greatest shark film. Ba, 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 ba. That, that's the wrong music. Don't get people's hopes up. This is the greatest shark film that aired at 8 p.m. on July 31st on the Sci-Fi Network. Oh, gosh. And there was only one film that aired on July 31st at 8 p.m. on the Sci-Fi Network, and that is... Sharknado 4, The Fourth Awakens. <laughs> That's me face palming. Now, in case you're wondering why we're talking about this on Sky Walking Through Neverland, well, it does feature a young Boba Fett, Daniel Logan, as Captain Fett, and loads of Star Wars references. And I thought it was going to be a parody on, on The Force Awakens. Uh-huh. No, that wasn't that no, wasn't it. No, <laughs> no. Well, you'll get into it a little later. Yeah, we we have fun with it, and so will you. Yes. Also on this episode, we have shout outs, the Skywalker of the week, and things, things we, we want, want to share. Things we want to share. Things we want to share. Things we want to share. Now, as we saw on Facebook and Twitter, fans everywhere were wishing Howard the Duck a very happy 30th anniversary. But there are many out there who has never even seen it due to the bad publicity and negative comments, thus never giving it a chance. Mm. So we want to share some fun facts and things you ought to know before you hear our discussion with Jedi Schwa and Shaz Bazaar in a segment within a segment called Things You Ought to Know. Dun, so, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't have a jingle for that one, so just go ahead and, and sing it. Okay. Things you ought to know. Ba-dum, ba-dum. Things you ought to know. Ba-dum, ba-dum. Now, Howard the Duck's first appearance happened in the comic Adventure into Fear, number 19, back in 1973. Then he had his own self-titled comic, which started in January 1976. Huh. Now, jumping over to the movie Howard the Duck, this was released on August the 1st, 1986, and it was executive produced by George Lucas, written by Willard Hike and Gloria Katz, who also wrote American Graffiti, and they also script doctored Star Wars. So most of the funny lines that you hear in Star Wars are, are from this couple. And it was also directed by Willard Hike as well. Now, tell everyone who stars in this mega blockbuster comic fest of the eyeballs. It stars Leah Thompson, who, of course, I know her from Back to the Future in this time. But in Howard the Duck, she is Beverly Switzler. Switzler. She is Beverly Switzler as the lead singer in the punk band Cherry Bomb. Rockin' band, too. Yeah. And it also stars Tim Robbins in his first theatrical film as Phil Blumbert, the scientist janitor who tries to help Howard get back to Duck World and probably has the worst line reading in the whole film. Howard! <laughs> that was terrible. Is he talking to you, Howard, or is I he know. talking to Fozzie Bear? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> now, this also stars Jeffrey Jones as Dr. Jennings and Many film fans know him as an early staple in Tim Burton films. He was Ferris Bueller's principal. And he's also known to the authorities as the guy who should not be near children unless he's at least a thousand feet away. Oh, <laughs> he's creepy looking, man. Well, yeah. Yeah. Now, inside the duck suit was a, a little guy named Ed Gale, who people also know as Chucky <laughs> from Child's Play. Now, the film started off having two actors play Howard the Duck inside the costume. One was a child, and one was Ed Gale. Now, the child was a little bit too... Childlike? Childlike, yeah. whereas Ed Gale, he was very, very manly. So the two, the two performances never cut together quite well. Right. Plus, being a kid, he can only work so long in a day. 
Right, and, and he had to do schooling and all that silly nonsense. And plus, Leah Thompson wasn't that comfortable doing some of the bedroom <laughs> scenes with a child. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> a duck is one thing. A child is another. <laughs> yes, that, yes, very, very much so. Okay. Now, six puppeteers <laughs> operated Howard, one of which was Tim Rose. All right, Scope Walkers, tell us who Tim Rose is. Do they know? Do they know? Give you one more second to tell us who Tim Rose is. Tim Rose is the puppeteer behind Admiral Akbar and Salacious Crumb in Return of the Jedi. And he also provided the voice offset, just so the actors have something to work off of. Okay, but and they didn't use his voice, right? No, no. no. His, his voice, Howard's voice, was done by Chip Zine. Oh. You're probably thinking, Chip Zine, where do I know that name from? I don't know it well, at all. He was in Guiding Light. Okay. He was reporter number four in Hello Again. <laughs> That Shelley Long masterpiece. Okay. And he was the baker in the 1987 Broadway play, Into the Woods. That's why I don't know his voice. <laughs> now, he was ultimately cast as Howard after hopefuls like Jason Alexander, oh. and Martin Short, and John Cusack. Well, they they did not pass the, uh, the audition. So I went to Chip Zine. I couldn't see John Cusack at that time being the voice because he's very young at that point. Huh. Yeah, yeah, he was in his early 20s. Oh, and, yeah. But he was still the big star of the day. Right. So I'm sure they were trying to get something like that, hmm. some kind of big star attached to the voice. Now, Jason Alexander at that point, he wasn't a big star. That no, Seinfeld not at all. hadn't. Yeah, not until you know. 1989 or 90. Wait, when is Seinfeld? Wasn't Seinfeld the 90s? Like late yeah. 90s? I want to say n- no, no, 90, 91. Now, Howard the Duck had a budget of $37 million. Okay. Which you can. You can't even do a short film for that anymore. <laughs> and had a worldwide box office gross of $38 million. So it's in the black by a million. Wow. However, domestically, Howard only made $16.2 million. Oh, no. <laughs> even with your going twice that weekend? <laughs> yeah. Aww. Yeah. I think The Force Awakens made that the first showing. Yeah. Oh, wow. You know what? Let's <laughs> go with the positives that it made $38 million. Yeah. Absolutely. And it... Only cost thirty-seven million to make. That's not including marketing. Shh. <laughs> now we go over more fun facts in our discussion, including the fact that without Howard the Duck, references like "To Infinity and Beyond" and "Just Keep Swimming" would have no meaning, since there would be no Pixar. What? Stay tuned. What is, what was, and what will be start here with the words, In the beginning there was Howard the Duck. It was the summer of 1986. Star Wars had already entered into the dark times. But for us fans, we looked forward to anything bearing the Lucasfilm logo. This was the summer that brought us Labyrinth. Then, two months later, on August 1st, The world was introduced to a duck named Howard. This film had a rockin' theme song, Leah Thompson in her skivvies, and a man in a duck suit. So here with us to talk about the 30th anniversary of Howard the Duck is Jedi Schwa and Shaz Bazaar from Techno Retro Dads. Hey, hey, Shaz and Schwa. Woo! Thank you. In a conversation like this, you have to have a master of quack food. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> oh, someone did their homework. <laughs> nice. Well, guys, thank you very much. And uh, you know what? This is like something that Techno Retro Dads would do on one of their shows covering something like Howard the Duck. But you know what? It has George Lucas. It has Phil Tip. It has so many Star Wars elements that, hey, you know what? It made the cut. But now, you know what? Give us a little background for those of the listeners who don't know what Techno Retro Dads is. We're dads who grew up in the... 70s and 80s and make our kids watch things like Howard the Duck. <laughs> that's not that's not entirely true. We share all the fun that we had in the 70s and 80s with our kids. Even the 90s. We've been getting into some 90s things, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, we, we talk about it. Video games, TV shows, movies, um, toys, lots of All toys. the things that made us who we are. So Cereal. we could be uh, good dads to screw up our kids the way we were screwed up as well. <laughs> and let's remind everyone that you are a podcast on our RetroZap.com awesome podcast network. 
We, our Retro Zap was created for us, even though they didn't know it. Exactly. As soon as they named it Retro Zap, that just begged us to come on. <laughs> it's very true. You know what? I'm going to change that in Wikipedia right now, okay? <laughs> All right, done. Now, let's jump over to Howard the Duck. Now, do you think at this point in time, people are now coming around and giving it another chance? Uh, oh, yeah. No. I mean, it's 30 <laughs> years later. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, giving it another chance. I don't know. I, I haven't heard of anybody actually... Uh, you know, stepping up in, in, in great defense of the movie. Um, like, you know, a vocal person. I, I will I will defend it, of course. But yeah, if anything, people look back and without even watching it, I think they, they badmouth it. You got to go back and watch it before you badmouth it. Yeah, for years, <laughs> all anyone ever did was bash Howard. And now little by little, I'm starting to hear people go, yeah, you know what? I, I watched that again and it, it was a lot of fun. It's a it funny, is. funny movie. Movie. And and you know they, I don't know why they why it got such bad reviews off off the bat. Yeah, we'll get to that later on. Maybe we will talk <laughs> talk about it. I'm not saying it's a great movie. I just I mean it was 1986. Yeah, it had a lot to live up to, and it was just kind of working against itself. But let's go back to 1986 on August the first. Did you two see it in the theater? I, I did Absolutely. see it in the theater. It had George Lucas's name on it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was there on opening weekend, and I saw it twice on opening weekend. <laughs> oh, wow. Inten- wow. Like, did you mean to see it intentionally a couple times? What does that mean? I guess. No. I, <laughs> well, I don't no, know what that means. No, I, like, did you- <laughs> I thought I was going to Top Gun. Like, wait a minute. When, since when does Tom Cruise have feathers? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> of oh course, I'm, anything with a George Lucas name on it, okay. I was there. Okay. Yeah, I'm, me too. Yeah, everybody else was going to Top Gun. I was going to Howard the Duck. Wow. Okay. Now it goes to show that I was five. I did not go see Howard the uh, Duck. This would have That's been good. a perfect <laughs> film for you at your age. No. Per- no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. You know what? Okay. Let me. I'm just now thinking about some of the yes. sexual overtones and <laughs> Leah Thompson and her skivvies. Back and- to the Future. Yes. Howard the Duck. <laughs> no. <laughs> What age do you think kids should see Howard the Duck? That you know what that is my one of my questions to you guys for, uh, is what was age was this intended for? Because That's a, a lot of the question. jokes, yeah, a lot of the jokes were very off color and adult, you know, adult minded, and yet it's a duck <laughs> in a in a world, you know, like I don't know. So, what do you guys think? Well, there was this movie called Deadpool came out not too long ago. And, uh, you know, people understood, well, some people understood that was not for kids. And and I think Howard the Duck at least deserved a rating higher than what it got. Well, and I, I think that was PG. maybe part of its problem um, yeah, is maybe. that it, it didn't it didn't really uh, narrow down what age it was for, you know, Um so, but as you know, as far as me as a dad thinking about like uh, what kind of kid I would show this to, um, you know, every kid's a little different as as to what is acceptable for them to watch. But if your kid is watching uh, superhero movies, you know, with the the violence and the mild language in it, I think that this one is tongue in cheek enough that they could handle something like that. If you got a little kid that gets scared by. Uh, a lot of action or if you got a little kid that's sensitive to uh more hmm, uh let's see uh age inappropriate language um <laughs> then you know it's not for them so you know for my kids yeah i think that's anywhere around 11 12 13 ish because we have conversations about w- what movies were like back then because there was certain language that was more acceptable in pg movies back in the 80s hmm. well even political correctness was a whole animal back then a whole different mm. animal yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah you watch, it exist. You watch things now. It's like, oh, you could never, never do that in a film today, ever. But now, you know, let's let's talk about some positive things about Howard the Duck. So, what what kind of positive things can you say about this film? Well, first of all, uh, it it's it's fun, right? And at, at least in my mind, when I first saw it, it doesn't take itself seriously in any way. You know, this is. This is not a darker, grittier Howard the Duck. This is intended to be fun for people to watch. A lot of humor, a lot of comedy in it. Um, 
again, for me, uh, and I was, you know, 13 when this movie came out. So, uh, it had some, some cool sci-fi ideas, you know, um, one of my favorite things, uh, in this, uh, from the sci-fi point of view was that big, weird scorpion looking creature at the end, the dark overlord. That's right. I just <laughs> love the design of it. Right. So you, you combine that, that, uh, wacky sci-fi cool character design with the humor in it. And that, that, it's the kind of stuff that appeals to me. That's the stuff I like. I agree with 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 uh, with all that. Except Schwa doesn't know how old he was. He was fifteen when this came out because I That's, was fourteen. Did I say thirteen? You did. did. I, I meant. I sorry. I. It's still summertime. <laughs> I don't know math yet. <laughs> it, it, the, it was humorous. I mean, it was the 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 humor that hit in a lot of campy movies from the late seventies and early to mid eighties. Um, and I think this was probably the end of that time. Maybe that worked against it, too. You know, the airplanes, the uh, naked gun. What else was, was like that? Mm. There was the one, the guy with the cow. What was that called, Schwa? Top Secret? Top Secret. With Val Kilmer? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, see, that's the kind of movie I like. That's why I like yeah. this one. <laughs> but but the, it, was, it, it fit into that genre. Uh, lots of funny parts. Like you mentioned already, the quack foo. Phil was a great <laughs> character in this. Perfectly suits the mid '80s glam rock style, um, but but I love the theme. It's the ordinary average duck who finds heroism in himself. <laughs> He's not a superhero. I think that's he, one of them for sure. I think that's awesome. I think the other idea is uh, accepting things, people you know that are different than you, hmm. which is what she did. You know, the, uh, she Leah was a Thompson's little too character. accepting of him. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a couple of bedroom scenes where she was kind of jumping the duck, the gun, jumping, All jumping, right. jumping something. Okay. Wow. <laughs> well, that's that's one of the things that I liked about this movie. Or first seeing Leah Thompson in her skivvies, <laughs> and then seeing those shots of Leah Thompson bending over, uh, making the bed. <laughs> And uh, I was right there with Howard. I was 17 years old, so I was like, oh, I'm so into this movie right now. I bet. (laughs) I have developed a greater appreciation for the female version of the human anatomy. Oh! Howard, you really are the worst. (laughs) Okay, yeah, Richard, you and I, see, we could have seen this one together and be like, yeah, this is a wonderful movie. (laughs) (laughs) We could have carpooled. Absolutely. (laughs) Compared notes and done a little podcasting afterwards. (laughs) Yeah, so I I really like that. I I really like the scene where she's um, fondling Howard, and all of a sudden little duck feathers go up, and <laughs> like, wait, okay. As a seventeen year old, I get that joke. These were the jokes. These were the tongue in cheek. I mean, and if you look at p- people look at that and and say how uh, I don't know inappropriate, how gross. I don't know, I've seen a lot of people make comments about that. Look at the movies we have today; they go so far above and beyond that. I mean, and and that's considered humor. And I'm not criticizing it in any way. I'm just saying, you know, you, you can't have these double standards when you talk about the movies we have today versus little little jokes like that. Oh, right. that was very tame back then. Even even now, it's it's still tame. <laughs> All right, Sarah. What what are some of the positive things you have to say about Howard the Duck? Okay, well, as as with all of you, I mean, Leah Thompson is infinitely likable, and even, you know, I know you guys are into her because of her skin showing. I you know what? I, she... I, that wasn't <laughs> where okay. I was going, but okay. I'll, I'll... I like yeah. her mind, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think. No, she but... sings the songs. <laughs> but for me, like, I, she's definitely cute. And, you know, she's someone I can look up to. And also, she reminds me of Back to the Future, of course, which was the, the year before this. So it's like, oh, I can equate Tower of the Duck to the Back to the Future. But and then also we watched the DVD with some special features. So just being able to watch the special features and knowing all the work, like specifically the girl band went through to actually sing their songs and get to try on their costumes and like learn the dance moves. Like I could really appreciate all the songs that they sang, especially the Howard the Duck at the end. So I think those were my favorite parts that I liked was the the whole girl factor. The the duck, not so much, but I can appreciate the animatronics and everything that went into that. I love that. The finale song that is by Thomas Dolby and George Clinton. It's one of those songs. Once you get it in your head, it's going to be there for at least two weeks. Yeah. 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 I've been driving around town singing it.
Yeah, deservingly so, because it, it is a good song. And, <laughs> and Leah Thompson, I'm surprised she didn't have a music career after this, because she was good. She could she hold was. the tune, and yep. there was a, a couple of other songs in the film that she was singing, and, and she was really good. And yeah. I know that during production, they were like, eh, we don't know if we're going to keep her voice, but I'm, I'm so glad they did, because yeah. it's... It, she really rocks it. Yeah, she really does rock it. One more thing I did enjoy is Leah Thompson's big hair. <laughs> I was just marveling at it. I, I didn't necessarily enjoy it. I was like, wow, that that was teased to hell. <laughs> Oh yeah, it, it took her a long time to get that hair every yeah. day. Yeah, and and for those of us who were only, or those of you who were only five years old that, in that year, that was pretty common. Oh, I know. Yeah, that was a big deal. In fact, I know. I remember growing up, like people would try to tease my hair like that, and I hated it. Like I hated '80s <laughs> hair as a kid. Yeah, I don't recall ever that ever being something out of the ordinary. Well, then again, well, the, the person next to me had hair that big yeah. in the theater. Right. But looking back at it, it's like, wow, look at that. And <laughs> Leah, Leah Thompson has even said that that was one of, her, one of her biggest regrets working on the movie, that she didn't insist on a wig because that took two hours a day to frizz up. Gosh. And that, that, that really could have... It worked for... Yeah. Or, or it worked for me, one of the two of us. I don't know. <laughs> and I can really appreciate, having been in the special effects industry, the Howard the Duck animatronic suit. Mm -hmm. Because I know how much work goes into that animatronic head and all the servos and gears and the puppeteers it takes to, to do that. And it all worked very fluently. I know that was one of the big things people would say, uh, that they, why they didn't like the movie, because the duck suit looked very strange and weird. But they did as much as they could with what they had. And, and I think even having so many servos in one's head and having someone in a suit like that for a whole film being the lead character, that was, that was revolutionary. Wait, wait a second. Did, did it look bad? No. A lot of people said, yeah, they looked, the suit looked very campy and didn't look realistic. Well, I think looking at it now, 30 years later, like you can really appreciate just the level that they had to go to to make it look good. And if people say that doesn't look real, it he's not a real duck. <laughs> he's not a duck like we're accustomed to. No. 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 He's a duck from Duck World. I thought I, I still think it looks good for the most part. There's a couple of times it didn't look so good. But most of the time, I thought it worked really well. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you think about his voice by Chip Zine? Did that match the character to you guys? Every duck's got his limit, and you scum have pushed me over the line. Shwa, hmm. what do you think? Um, well, okay, so Howard the Duck, I, I don't know, you know how much you've talked about this or if people know this, but he was a Marvel comic character. Yes. Um, and uh, it was, he was drawn and portrayed as a very, you know, crass, kind of over-the-top uh uh, I, I don't know what you call those type of guys, but, you know, cigar smoking, trash talking kind of thing. And and I almost think that they didn't do enough of that. And I could you could hear it in the voice. And I even think the duck suit maybe made it uh, a little less um, not offensive, but he didn't seem as gruff. Right. right. Uh, and I think that would have helped a little bit. So I always thought they could have gruffed him up a little bit. But in context of this movie. Uh, after you, you just get to know the character and you start watching it, it, it started fitting. And I, uh, you know, I went with it. I was okay with it. Uh, I had no previous experience with Howard the Duck. So this is the voice I expect. And then, then I run into uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Hmm. I thought, that's not Howard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that voice was Seth Green, which I still do not think is is the Howard the Vo Howard the Duck voice I heard while reading the comic in the mm. 70s. Well, right, it's too Seth Green. What do you let it lick you like that for? Gross. It's like, yeah. oh, it makes you think of... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But the voice I would have loved to have heard in the 1986 Howard the Duck is Will Arnett. Batman out. Wait, wait, wait. Batman back in. Forgot to drop the mic. Very grovelly, very grainy, like very the Batman rough. voice. Yeah, yeah. That was one of the things that kind of caught me off guard while seeing the uh, the film in the theater. It's like mm, that's that's not really Howard, but I can see where the filmmakers had a very very thin line to to straddle. It needs to be a kids' film, but yet it needs to be the crude, rude, and perverted Howard the Duck that he is in the comics. 
Mm. That's extremely, extremely hard. And I think that's why they went with Chip Zine's voice. Right. Well, now what's interesting is compare Howard the Duck to Rocket Raccoon, which if you think about it, is kind of the same character. I mean, you have a gruff voice, you have this weird looking, you know, thing that doesn't belong in the human world necessarily. And, and, you know, just to compare the two, I I mean, Guardians of the Galaxy, of course, benefited from 30 years of, of uh, special effects and technology. Exactly. I agree with the, the rocket raccoon thing that that's a little bit more, I think what, Howard was portrayed as in the comics mm. and probably would have served him a little bit better to appeal to a wider audience. Um, you know, back then, I mean, who's to say what, you know, what the audiences would have liked because they're much different than they are now. But mm. that's I, I think it fit him a little bit better for the original character. It would have been a different movie. It yeah. would have been because because he seemed almost somewhat innocent uh, yeah. in it, with with the voice that he had, if you had that more grovelly thing, he would be more uh, uh, jaded sound to him. Yeah, I think you would have believed all of the gruffness of his character when he's looking through Playbill. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say he's innocent up until you look yeah. into his wallet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think it, those scenes would have played a little bit better had he been a, a more of a gruff character. Mm. And originally. George Lucas and writers William Hike and Gloria Katz and Will- Willard Hike, who also directed it, they wanted this to be an animated film. Yeah. But because of a contractual agreement Lucas had with Universal, they had to make it into a live action film. And Universal needed a tentpole movie for the summer of 86. So that led to them strong arming them into saying, hey, you know what? We need a live action film. There you go. Let's, let's go for it. So I think wow. if Lucas had it his way, he, it would have been an animated film, and I think they would have spent a little bit more time developing Howard as he was in the comic. Right. Now, here's a, a couple of fun facts that I found. Yay. That if you don't know already, this will be really fun. Like, Guardians <laughs> of the Galaxy came out 28 years to the day after Howard the Duck on August 1st, 2014. Awesome. 28 years after Howard the Duck. Wow. Wow. Who would ever think that it would take him 28 years to make it to the big screen again, and not, and not 38 years? All right. <laughs> Let's take a break from our discussion with Schwa and Shaz and hear a clip of Leah Thompson on Late Night with David Letterman in 1986, getting in some trouble revealing the name of the actor inside the duck suit. And now you're in this Howard the Duck deal. Yeah. 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 Now, what is, what is this? This is, now, again, this is a big film, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Who produced this deal? This is one of those George Lucas films? George. Yeah. And uh, Howard the Duck is a duck. He's a duck. Three uh-huh. feet two. Uh-huh. Is he in, is a, in a duck suit or, uh, well, no, no, stupid. They have a three-foot duck. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. The cast but I, I, what I meant was he's not animated in, and no. you folks act around him. No. It's an actual guy in an actual duck suit. Who, who's the guy in the suit? Uh, well, I'm not supposed to say that. Ah, come on, come oh, on. Come on. Oh. Is it a man or a woman in the it's, duck suit? It's a man. A man? It's what's, a man. What's the his man name? duck. What, what's his name? All right, all right, all right. You guys are the first to know. His name is Ed Gale, okay? Ed Gale. He does wonderful ducks. Yeah. Uh, no, I understand. We actually have you a clip from gonna, Howard the Duck here. You're going to get me in a lot of trouble for that. No, they won't. They won't. <laughs> you know what's going to happen? This movie will be a huge success, and then after the film comes out, Ed will be going around on show and saying, yeah, I was, I was the duck in Howard the Duck. And, <laughs> and that'll last for about nine, nine weeks or so, and he'll have enough money to buy a trailer, and we'll never hear from him again. <laughs> That's, I mean, that always happens. You'll hear, and then there'll be a lawsuit. Ed will start, and then somebody yeah. else saying, no, no, it wasn't Ed Gale. I was the duck, and then there'll be a suit. <laughs> And now, back to Techno Retro Dads, Schwa and Shaz, as we discuss the 30th anniversary of Howard the Duck. This is obviously no place for an intelligent, sensitive duck. Now, a lot of people, this this one here, uh, a lot of people will argue over, but this is the first theatrical Marvel film, if you don't count the Captain America films, serials of the 30s and 40s, Howard the Duck is the very first Marvel film. Asterisk, unless you count Conan the, the Barbarian from 1982, uh, but he wasn't a an original Marvel character. Oh, whereas right. Howard the Duck was created by Steve Gerber. Wow. So I know I've I've gotten to a lot of uh, arguments at conventions over that one. There, people say, "Yeah, I know what the, what the first Marvel <laughs> film is, Howard the Duck." 
Yes and no. Okay. A lot of asterisks on that one. Hmm. And did you know that we wouldn't have Finding Dory or Toy Story or Cars if it hadn't been for Howard the Duck? Why? Because what? after all the monetary losses from Howard, George Lucas had to sell off the graphics group to Steve Jobs, oh. which, who made it into Pixar. Whoa. So if Lucas hadn't needed the money, he would have probably held on to it, and you wouldn't have had Pixar. See how influential Howard <laughs> exactly. is. Exactly. He's important. That kind of blows my mind. Yeah, I know. I know. You know what? This is the, that, That's the point I'm going to bring up if anyone ever tries to badmouth Howard again. There you go. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> now, this one here, you probably knew that due to Howard's resemblance to Donald Duck, Disney... <laughs> Almost sued Marvel for copyright infringement until Marvel redressed Howard in pants and then redesigned his whole face. <laughs> pants saved yep. the day. Yeah. Yeah. Once again, <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. Our duck has pants. Or our duck does not does have not. pants. Yeah. Your duck does not have pants. Yeah. Right. We gotta we gotta do this. We well, gotta looking, fix this. Looking at those original pictures, it looked a lot like Donald Duck. Yeah. Howard the duck did. Well, that's just hey. So Donald right. never wears pants. So I'm now I'm wondering how innocent Donald <laughs> really is because uh, how Donald's not. Donald, well, pants, I don't know if so. Donald ha- doesn't have pants. That means he can't carry a wallet. <laughs> that's why he carries a fanny pack. Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness! Now, I know in my neighborhood, if you walk around without pants, folks tend to get a little hesitant uh, about approaching you, or they just call the police. <laughs> Right. Well, I and thought now, that was folks, legal out there. Li- listeners, I'm just going to say, he, I, he, I want to point out that he said, I know that in my neighborhood. So that means that he has at one time tried that. Uh, What's your point? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. That was it. That was it. Just, just getting a picture <laughs> in my head there. So. Awesome. Well, before we move on to some of these other questions, I had a question for you guys specifically. And, you know, Richard, okay. you were saying this came out during the dark times, Howard the Duck. The Star Wars dark the times. The Star Wars dark times. And that you would go see anything with the Lucasfilm label. Now, if there was not Lucasfilm attached and you no. went and saw this in the theaters, would you have enjoyed it <laughs> as much and, you know, defended it as much? Guys? At fourteen, okay. probably, probably it was okay. it was funny. Uh, I would have seen it for sure because I saw everything. Uh, I would have enjoyed it because I'm really easy to please. Uh, but would I have been defending it up till today? <laughs> no, nah, probably not. I mean, just to be honest, you know, I I I probably wouldn't give it as much thought. Right. I was still a big Marvel fan back then, and having and knowing that this is a Marvel film, I would have gone to see it. I would, but afterwards, I would have gone to. Do whatever, play Do some video games thing. or whatever, and, and forgotten about it. And like you guys were saying, yeah. I wouldn't be here well, I, thirty years later it. defending it and talking about it. Okay. Yeah. One one of my collections that I have that's Star Wars related is I, I like to collect anything that was either influenced that it either influenced Star Wars or was influenced by Star Wars. And because this was a George Lucas movie, you know, I have it. I'm the same reason I have Corvette yeah. Summer. That I got to get autographed by Mark Hamill someday. Awesome. Uh, but you know what? Then I would have missed out. I would have missed out because watching it last week, I had a lot of fun with it. Okay. So I'm glad I did have the Lucasfilm logo because a lot of stuff you'll see in the 1980s, you'll watch again. It's like, oh, oh. Have you guys tried watching Ferris Bueller lately? <laughs> does not hold up. But. Oh, see, I love Ferris Bueller. <laughs> but does it hold up? Uh I don't, yeah, I don't know. Well, I still love it. For people who lived <laughs> but, back then, sure. But I do get your point. I do get your point. Any 17-year-old year walks into a fancy restaurant and says they're the sausage king of Chicago, the, the, the maitre d' is going to believe him? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> oh, I didn't believe it then. That, that whole thing I didn't believe, but I, it was just I, fun. Any movie I watch, no matter what it is, I try to put myself in the, the, the context of, of that era, you know, the year it was made or the or the year that it was portraying you know like uh like that new stranger things uh series on netflix right that's yeah. set in the 80s and so i try to kind of put myself in place because you can enjoy movies that were made in a much much different time with say much different presentation of dialogue you know the, pre- the uh, come on you know the the dialogue in this movie would never <laughs> be presented in a movie today they would never do that. Even in a comedy, they would never do that. It was so over the top. You do know why you were sent to me? My continuing streak of bad luck? <laughs> You've been sent to me because I'm famous for finding jobs for little slackers like you. That's right. 
They send me all the psycho cases, all the misfits, all the phonies and the fakers mm. who think that by traipsing in here looking outlandish, they are not going to be able to find work. It's my fault. I got a shoplift at the Little Tyke section of Goodwill. Yeah. Right, right. And then try watching Beverly Hills Cop. The, the same thing. The <laughs> 80s were just filled with movies with dumb people. Get, you could put anything over on them. All right, now that we've gone over some fun facts and some positive things, where do you think Howard the Duck went wrong? Mm, I'll call it risque humor slash explicit content. Right. It starts off with two naked ducks. Now, <laughs> normally, normally naked <laughs> ducks aren't a problem. Not but these completely naked. Ducks naked. Look a different. It was oh, just, oh, you know, topless. That's, it was in the uh, top. That's a whole different rating in Hollywood. The female, the <laughs> yes. female duck. Yes, that was very disturbing. <laughs> that, that, I knew I should not be watching that then, but I had paid, so I so I watched it anyway. <laughs> At that age, so now I I know this was really meant for people of our age back then who were just maybe growing out of Star Wars and wanted the Star Wars for the older kids, which is why we liked movies like Ghostbusters or Howard the Duck that were a little bit more mature, maybe use more mature language and situations. So I think that was this film was supposed to fit into to that the the Star Wars uh, generation growing a little bit older. Mm. But I just don't think it it totally worked because of well for me when people are too accepting of something like a Duck walking around the the city wearing clothes and talking, and here's here's Howard at the unemployment office, and <laughs> no one's even mentioning the fact that why is a duck trying to get a job? And if you're on the public dole, you can't be because you don't have a social security number. <laughs> this is the kinds of things going through my head. Well, he might have had one. It was right. just from Duck World that she That's didn't check. Right, that, you know? right. Uh, you know, I, did you think these things I back did. then? I did. Oh, uh, I did. See, I, I did. I did. Too. I was reading comics. It didn't, and I, I didn't it let up. it get to me, but I, I did think them. Yeah. And I, I was thinking that, you know, it's it's I can see where Raiders of the Lost Ark and the Indiana Jones films. Those are for the older generation of Star Wars fans. And those worked. But something like this was trying a little, you know, when you try a little too hard at something, it just doesn't work when you're trying to be too entertaining or too funny you just you always fall flat mm. i think this had the problem there and if you take out those scenes of howard trying to acclimate himself to the chicago way of living you, it, the film would be a lot tighter and wait a minute he's only been here for about 13 hours you mean cleveland cleveland what did yeah. i say chicago, chicago. cleveland <laughs> yes yeah, so i i think the film slowed down in the beginning where he is trying to get a job and get a new life wouldn't you want to get out of there? I know that that's what he did eventually, but I think the film slowed down there. I know you would have taken 20 minutes out, but I think that maybe would have saved the film a little bit. Hmm. I'm going to agree with you there too. And I even think just the pace of the movie, and I didn't notice this stuff when I was a kid, but it does affect your enjoyment of it, you know, when you watch it. But knowing what I know now about the making of movies and, and seeing as many movies as I've seen, you'll notice that the pacing of it is a little bit slower. The scenes are just a little bit too long, especially one that stood out to me was the diner scene when he was kind of being attacked in the diner and um, it, you know, they were going to they slid him across the counter and all that. Everything just lasted just a little bit too long. It wasn't quite fast or intense enough. If, <laughs> if Lucas had been directing it, maybe that would have changed. I don't know. I think you're probably right on that. Yeah, that and the the uh, the ultralight plane scene. Oh, that was... You could have taken at least 20 minutes out of that. <laughs> what I found amusing yeah. about that is, yeah. who who escaped on the plane? It was Tim it was Robbins. Howard and Phil, Phil, played by Tim Robbins. Right. So Howard and Phil go across the street, get get out of the overlord's way. You know, they're 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 hidden. They could have just kept walking, but instead they decide to fix this plane. And then once the sun is up, they're like, all right, let's fly this now and alert everyone to our presence. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it, it made for something action oriented. Oh, I know. Them walking away, not too much fun to watch. No, it's not. No, and definitely the scene was fun, even if it did last a little too long, the, the whole flying the plane. Right. But. I think as a kid, the love scene between Beverly played by Leah Thompson and Howard 
it, it didn't really sit right with me. Mm. Maybe it's not a man you should be looking for. Ah, uh, you think I might find happiness in the animal kingdom, Ducky? Like they say, Dal, love's strange. We could always give it a try. Hmm. <sighs> okay. Let's go for it, Mister Macho. And 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 that's it. That sits yes. right with you now? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, see, you haven't seen The Way We Live, have you? <laughs> what, the, what are you implying? Uh, I think you know. You, okay. you just, you've just always ignored it. it it's, it's, it's humor, right? I mean, it's, it's supposed just to be saying. over the top. You know where it really went wrong in the movie, though? Where it really went wrong? You mentioned the diner. It was Cajun sushi. Ew. <laughs> <That's where. laughs> Never. That sounds delicious. Ever. No. <laughs> Beware what they call sushi on the menu. It may have barked earlier. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I found it kind of disturbing that that they were going to uh, cook Howard, and even all the customers were yes. like, yeah, we're in, we're, we're in. We're in, let's do this. Like, it was duck season. Yes. They're hungry for some but here's duck. a living, like, thing. I don't care if it's not a person, but yeah, everyone in that diner was like, yes, we're going to eat this duck. I'm just glad that family with that that had the kid with the Empire Strikes Back shirt. I'm glad they got out of there. Yes, <laughs> yes, I love that. What a great nod. Yeah, and as far as I know, that was the only Easter egg. Oh, there was a Wilhelm scream. Oh yes, when yes. they're flying the ultra light. Also with the plane. Yep. yep. When they're uh, chasing down the duck hunters and the guy falls out of the boat, you hear the Wilhelm <laughs> scream. But yeah. I didn't. I, I would say that I would say there's a lot of Easter eggs at the beginning and any any uh, you know duck sure. hunt. Yeah. From. For, you know that that takes from our world and puts a little duck theme on it. I, I, I consider those Easter like eggs. The Indiana Jones, was the was yeah, the breeders of the lost duck. No, it's Indiana oh. duck. I believe like breeders of the lost fowl or something to that effect. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and at top it said from the makers of Beak in Fowl Wars. Oh, nice. So, but other than that, <laughs> and then we see Howard's phone number on his phone, and it's five five five. Two three six eight, and I dug for about three days trying to find significance there, but I found nothing. Did you call it? Oh, I know I forgot something. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> but when does whenever does a five 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 number work? No, I'm thinking no. okay, two three six eight. That's February third, nineteen sixty eight. But no, once again, nothing. Hmm. Unless hmm. that was someone in the art department's kid's birthday. <laughs> And that's that's always what it comes down to. <laughs> now, cut 28 years later after the debut of Howard the Duck, we see him in Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm -hmm. And audiences went crazy. They loved it. They cheered and they, they talked all about it. Why do you think that is? Why do you think the people accepted Howard the Duck being in Guardians of the Galaxy? It's the well, curious thing called nostalgia. You remember things better than what they were. <laughs> And I think that's part of it. I think it's something that, you know, Howard the Duck was kind of a fun comic character, and it's something that people would like to see redone a little better, you know? Yeah. So I, I think it, it gave them the idea that, well, may, may, maybe they're thinking about uh, trying this one more time, you know, fixing it up a little bit. But that's why I think they were excited about it. Do you it. think? I'd go see it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you think they'll ever do a reboot? Uh, I think they will. You do, yeah. yeah, I do too. All right, I do too. I well, think now that the yep. technology and with the with the technology that we have now, yeah, and the success of Rocket yep. Raccoon as well. Absolutely, Howard's going to look like a female version of Daffy. And it's going to be voiced by Eric Bauza. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, who, remind me who Eric Bauza is? Luke Skywalker. Uh, <gasps> oh, he, in the Disney like, Infinity and oh, <laughs> oh, did he do Luke and Disney Infinities? Yeah. yeah. He also, uh, he does a great Chris Rock. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Well, well, you know what, guys? I don't want to burst your bubble, but according to Seth Green at New York Comic Con back in October of 2015, he spoke with IGN, and he had this to say. Nobody is thinking about a Howard the Duck movie. I love that people are running with it, but, you know, it's not going to happen. The most I can imagine, and you can't quote me because it's not based in fact, but the most I can imagine is that the character could cameo at some point in some other thing. Mm, huh? Some kind of outer galactic mayhem. You can imagine that Howard would cameo in that, but he'll never have a standalone movie again. So what's the authority he's speaking with here, though? 
Well, that's the thing. I, you know, I don't know. That's a good question. But I maybe he's heard something. <laughs> yeah. So hmm. I think like, well, like he was saying, I think Howard works best in an ensemble and maybe in cameos, but to have his own film again. I, I think they said that about Ghostbusters four years ago. <laughs> uh. Well, I, if it happens, it's not going to happen anytime soon. Hmm. You know, they've got so many Marvel movies on their plate right wow. now. I don't think they're going to throw it in there. But um, in the in the distant future, when this uh, superhero era of movies is winding down <laughs> and they've... <laughs> And they've run out of superheroes <laughs> to use, and they, you know, uh, th- then they might uh, they might dig deep in that well and go, ah, eh, let's give it a shot. <laughs> well, if they remake it, it's and and I, th- I do, I think they will. They, they remake everything. They they're going to make it still humorous and campy. It will not be one of the superhero movies, though. Hmm. It'll find some other venue, and it might be animated. R- right, oh. it could be animated. Yeah, Marvel has already posted their slate of films for the next. Like six, seven years, and Howard's not on there. Even though there are some untitled projects, hmm. I, I don't <laughs> think Howard's going to be one of them. Yeah, you don't think that's one of them? Huh? Okay. No, <laughs> but I do think he's going to be in Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout, the new ride over at Disney's California Adventure. Oh, that would be so cool. Because it's set in the collector's warehouse. So you uh-huh. know you're going to see an animatronic Howard the Duck, and if there is not, I'm going to throw a hissy fit unlike you've ever seen before. <laughs> Uh, I would love it, and I, I would love to see uh, the Lucas version of it. Mm. Uh, and even <laughs> and even if they do, even if they do both, you know, just a little homage to the Lucas version of it. I think that would be fun. Huh. Huh. I would, you cool. know, I'm with you. I'd prefer to see the Lucas version, but then you can have all these kids going, "That's not Howard the Duck, right?" <laughs> <laughs> no, but they could put up the Breeders of the Lost Fowl or whatever poster <laughs> behind it, something like that. As a a cameo, or maybe just his picture on a wall. That's funny. Yeah, or they could even have two Howards. One on mm. one end of the building, one on the other end of the building. But you know, this mm. is, they are going to focus on the Guardians of the Galaxy characters, though. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> but we are. Not if I can help it. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start a petition. <laughs> All right, guys. So before we wind down, is there any last comments you want to make about Howard the Duck? It holds up, but not to today's FX standards. It's great to take a back a trip back to the '80s, and that's what this movie is. It's, a, it's going back to the '80s. Yeah, go see it for some good, you know, reminiscing fun. That's that's what it's all about. Don't go it in there comparing it to anything else. Just go in there looking at looking at it what it is uh, a silly, campy movie that's intended to uh, help you laugh every once in a while. That's right, true. Right. And when people always mention the Star Wars holiday special, I tell them, you got to go watch this. Like, oh, I've heard this and I, I saw that. But don't watch it through the eyes that you had watched The Force Awakens. Watch it through the eyes no. of the 1970s, and you'll really yes. enjoy most of it. Uh, or better Perfect. yet, watch Sharknado 4 first <laughs> and go, oh, my God, <laughs> that was terrible. And then watch Howard the Duck and be like, wow, this is the best movie ever. There you go. See, it's all in time. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a good context. <laughs> well, I believe you're going to watch Howard the Duck anytime in the end today. And mm-hmm. you can still enjoy it as long as you watch it through the eyes of 1986 and just have fun with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. Now, before we wrap things up, can you tell people where they can find Techno Retro Dads and maybe yourselves on social media? Well, you can find Techno Retro Dads on Facebook. Search for Techno Retro Dads. You can find us on the Twitter at Techno Retro Dads. We have no spaces in that version. <laughs> but you can find me at Chaz Bazaar on the Twitter. That's right, and uh, I'm Jedi Schwa on the on the Twitter. So you get on there and uh, tell me how wrong I am about Howard the Duck. That's just fine. I have no problem with that because I like it. <laughs> and of course, you can find Techno Retro Dads on RetroZap.com, as well as Skywalking Through Neverland. Awesome. Which you guys are frequent guests because you are so much fun and you do your homework and you love the eighties. Love the eighties. You know, one thing that was missing from Howard the Duck. What's what? that? The monkeys. The monkeys. No monkeys oh. references. Oh, there you go. Oh, see, now you made me sad. <laughs> now you made me sad. <laughs> I just ruined your childhood for Last you. Last train to Ducksville. A little bit me, a little bit duck. <laughs> duck collector. I'm gonna go on and see. On. We just need to write the next Howard the Duck. <laughs> <laughs> collector of ducks. That would be great. Nice. Awesome. Shout outs, Skywalker shout outs. Which Skywalkers get props from here in Neverland? Who 
was tweeted out. Shout out who was photo ball. Shout out who was shared a poll. Shout out. So I went to Twitter for some shout outs and Rick Peralta at Kilted Jedi. He really liked our Firefly discussion on the last episode and he tweeted, you can't take the sky from me. Leaf on the wind. Hashtag brown coats forever. So I can now say I have watched the whole season of Firefly. Yay. I'm one of you guys now. (laughs) But now we have to watch the movie Serenity. It's true. Yeah, we still need to watch. And I've never seen that. So I don't know what I was missing. So, yeah, that'll be fun to experience together. Joey Pittman just scope walked. You're a big damn hero. (laughs) That I am. You know what? I don't take that word lightly, hero. But I can say I'm a hero now. So Firefly was very popular on Twitter. And Neil Cassidy, who is at Orbital underscore Puka, he tweeted that he was... What? Nothing. Go ahead. He tweeted letting us know the right disc order to watch it in because uh, obviously Fox had put Firefly out incorrectly in the incorrect order. So he said to watch it in the disc order that we get it on, which which is what we did. But he also recommended that we watch the movie Serenity, which is how I first heard of the movie Serenity. So thank you, Neil. Well, that is on our list after... We get to watch Ratchet and Clank because we're we're talking to James Arnold Taylor tomorrow. (gasps) And then after that... We will watch Serenity. Yes. All right. Moving on to an iTunes review. Richard, we got an iTunes review. Love these. When did this come in? This came in in mid-July. So we want to thank... Mid-July? Yeah. We want to thank Blood Musician, who wrote that review, and he labeled it Top Star Wars and Disney Podcast. So I wanted to read this to you for the first time here. You ready? I didn't read this. Go ahead. Okay. He writes, top podcast on my feed and listen as soon as it is available. Sarah and Richard are a great pair of podcasters. Their enthusiasm for Disney and Star Wars is infectious and enduring. The husband and wife team are very welcoming to all newcomers and longtime listeners. You'll finish each podcast with a smile on your face and a spring in your step. I am totally stealing that last line. So if you see it on Twitter, that, that's why. How nice. I know. How nice of him. Who is this? This is Blood Musician. Blood, Blood Musician. Which everyone's names on iTunes are maybe different from like what, what you see. Right. So we want to thank you very much. Yeah. Aw. That puts an extra bounce in my step. I know. And Joey, Guy Joey is right. said well, that too. Thank you, Joey. Now on our Facebook group... We've gotten some requests lately from Skywalkers asking to post links to things that they make, like artwork, podcasts, articles, books, etc. So what we are implementing is a fan-made Friday post, or a Skywalker share post, if you will. So every Friday, we're going to post the same fan-made Friday photo in the group, and then you can then post a link to whatever you would like to promote in that in those comments so uh that that way all the skywalkers in the group who are getting to know each other can also get to know what we all do and if it's something fan made that we can su- help support each other i think it's a really fun way to do this for, that is a great idea yeah for skywalkers to support skywalkers so just make sure that you post every friday anything you want to promote in the comments of that post and make sure please that it is family friendly and it makes sense for the group you know, no like Walking Dead things or stuff that doesn't make sense. That's not necessarily Star Wars, Disney, Marvel movies. You know, how family about, appropriate. How about Sharknado? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think after this episode, we're done with Sharknado. Yes, yes. Anyway, All right, that so, is a great idea. Yeah, so that's what we're doing, and please look for that post on Fridays. All right, now let's hear who is the Skywalker of the week. Ken. Ken Mill. Ken Mills, you are the Skywalker of the Week. Yay! Now, many of you may know Ken because he is the host and founder of Zilch, a monkey's podcast. And we've gotten quite uh, friendly with Ken. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's been giving us advice. He does a, a huge show, and we've been... Uh, going back and forth with uh, things that we're sharing with each other. Oh, we've been on the show before, too. Yeah, yeah. So, Ken, you've been helping us so much that you are the Skywalker of the Week, as composed by Rob Dellinger. 
the John Williams of podcasting. And Skywalkers, if you want your very own jingle, all you have to do is promote our show in some way or interact with us on social media, such as Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, wherever. And you may be in the running to become the Skywalker of the week and get your very own jingle. By Rob Dellinger, the Neil Diamond of podcasting. (laughs) That's for you monkey fans. (laughs) And my mom. (laughs) And now, let's go from ducks to sharks and review Sharknado 4, The Fourth Awakens. Now, unfortunately, Sarah, you could not be here. You had a... You had to work. I did have to work, but Mark was here. So in my place, let's just sub out my voice for Mark's voice. Done and done. This summer, get ready for a new chapter in the greatest cinematic franchise of all time. No, not that one. This one. After five years without a Sharknado attack, they're back. Residents and tourists are urged at this time to get inside. Oh, my God. Go, go, go! We will keep our viewers informed as more details emerge from yet another catastrophic event. Where's everybody going? It's the sequel to the sequel of the sequel to the greatest movie about sharks and tornadoes that's ever existed. Go, 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 go. Run away from the Sharknado. The Fourth Awakens. Premiere Sunday, July 31st on Sci-Fi. May the Force be with you. How many story concepts do you hear and immediately say, I'm in? I know I said that when I heard about Sci-Fi Channel's franchise where they combined sharks and tornadoes and came up with Sharknado. How much fun and terror could come from that? Well... That is what we are talking about today. With us now to talk about the fourth installment in the Sharknado saga titled The Fourth Awakens is my co-host on Talking Apes TV. Here he is, Mr. Mark Ogushiewicz. Hey, hey, Mark. Hey, hey, Rich. Are you ready to talk about how the gods from the Planet of the Apes TV series have been sucked up into tornadoes to attack and try and kill all of humanity? Oh, you know I am. Now... The listeners are probably wondering, why are you guys talking about Sharknado on a Star Wars Disney podcast? Well, the title, The Fourth Awakens, we had originally gotten a screener of this, and I thought, oh, this will be so much fun. So I planned this big segment, and then I watched it, (laughs) and it had nothing to do with The Force Awakens. I thought it was going to be a parody on The Force Awakens, but with sharks, that wasn't the case. No, it wasn't. No, no, but yeah. There were a couple of... There was, a, there was a couple of Star Wars references, including one cameo, so I thought, you know what, let's throw it into this mega episode where we just talked about Howard the Duck. This seems very, <laughs> very fitting. So, Mark, being the Sharknado expert here, catch us up to speed on this saga of sharks and nados. Okay, so we are on the fourth movie, and guess what happens? Sharks get sucked up into a tornado. Oh, but, 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 say spoiler alert first. Oh, I'm sorry. Spoiler alert. Sharks get <laughs> sucked up into a tornado, and Finn Shepard has to help to destroy these tornadoes once again. That's basically all it really is. All right. Now, there were some story elements that I was lost in because I didn't see Sharknado 3. Oh, hell no. So what happened in Sharknado 3 that you needed to know before going into Sharknado 4? Well, there was a bunch of stuff that you might be a little lost on with Sharknado 4. One in particular is right at the beginning, you have a little boy drawing a picture of his grandma, his dad, and his sister. If I'm getting this right, I think I'm remembering right. His sister and a shark that he names Mom. Yes, I was very lost on that. And yeah, and nowhere in the whole entire movie do they explain this. But in order for me to explain it to you, I have to spoil something at the very end of Sharknado 3. All right, so let's go ahead and say this will be spoiler heavy. Okay, so we're going to basically be spoiling all four, I guess. So if you haven't (laughs) seen it, check it out before you listen to us, or maybe not check it out, depending on, you know, opinions on whether you liked it or not. 
Uh, at the end of Sharknado 1, you'll remember that a girl gets swallowed into a shark, and the very last thing that our hero does is he reaches into the shark and pulls her out. Now, our hero, that's the character Finn. That's the character Finn. So not to be confused with John Boyega's Finn in The Force Awakens, and he's the one played by Ian Zerling. Right. I think that J.J. Abrams was a big fan of Sharknado because he named his <laughs> character in The Force Awakens after... Finn, maybe? You can reach Mark at Mark Ogoshowitz at Talking Apes TV. Okay, I I don't know that as a fact. I'm just making an assumption. All right, let's be very clear on that. All right, anyway, um, at the end of the first Sharknado, because the first Sharknado is a great movie. It's, well, the first Sharknado, it's a really fun movie. Okay. Don't put in great words. Uh, Yes, I'm leaving that in. It's it's not a great movie, but it's a really fun movie. And it's fun because it does these really outrageous things. And at the very end of the first Sharknado, a girl is eaten by a shark. And you think she's a goner, you think she's dead, until Finn reaches into the shark and pulls her out and frees her. After she's been in there for a little while, I believe, if now, I remember that, correctly. Was that girl Tara Reed? No, that was another girl. <laughs> And she re- makes a reappearance in Sharknado 3 as well as a major character. The one who gets swallowed. The one who gets swallowed in Sharknado 1. Gotcha. You following along? Yeah, I, I am now. Yeah, I got my abacus. Okay, but that has nothing to do with the end of Sharknado 3. That has to do with Sharknado 4. Okay. Okay, so it, then you go and you watch Sharknado 2, which is a little bit of a disappointment from Sharknado 1 because it doesn't go as crazy as the first Sharknado. It's still fun and it's still entertaining, but it doesn't reach that level of insanity. So then when you're watching Sharknado 3 and this thing happens that you need to know about for Sharknado 4, you realize that Sharknado 3 is not scared to reach this level of insanity. Because in the first movie, we see a girl swallowed by a shark and then yanked out of the shark. In the third one, Tara Reid is swallowed by a shark and then she's pregnant throughout the whole entire movie. I should let you know that so she's pregnant throughout the whole entire movie and she gets swallowed by the shark and you go and finn walks over to the shark and you see this cut in the shark and you're expecting him to reach in and pull tara reed out again until the cut from the shark starts to open up and a little baby is handed out through the hole oh, in the shut shark. up shut <laughs> Oh. I mean, this is insane. This is why I like these movies is because they're so insane. I mean, she gave birth to the baby inside the shark. <laughs> you should see your wow. face right now. How did I miss Sharknado? <laughs> how did I miss Sharknado 3? I, I do love these kind of movies. I don't know Sharknado, how I missed this. Sharknado 3 is a lot of fun. Um, I'll tell you right up front. I wish Sharknado 4 was as much fun. It's really not. But that one thing from Sharknado 3 you need to know for Sharknado 4, you're going to be wondering, why does this kid think his mom is a shark? Because right at the end of Sharknado 3, this big piece of what I think is an airplane, it's really fast, comes down and lands on Tara Reid. We don't know whether she's dead or not. It just ends there. And you well, need, no, and you need an to know that. And an you, airplane lands on her? No, we don't know if she's dead a or not? Pe- a piece. It, actually, it might be a piece of a satellite. It's not very clear. I'm trying to remember how the end of the movie goes because they go up into the shuttle into space, and the end it actually ends on Earth. So it's probably either a piece of a satellite, a piece of a uh, a piece of the shuttle they were in. It's okay. got an American flag on it. It comes falling down. So wait a minute. So Sharknado 3 was set in space. No, so Sharknado 3 was not set in space, although they go into space with David Hasselhoff to have to do something up there to save the day. Okay, okay. Um, and David Hasselhoff is left on the moon. He sacrifices himself to save the day. Of course, <laughs> he comes back for Sharknado 4, um, which is something you need to know for Sharknado 4 as well. That's, right. some, that's something that if you don't know, you won't completely be lost, but it's kind of cool to know the connection. All right, so now go back to Tara Reid. So this this piece of space shuttle, whatever it was, falls and lands on her, and we don't know what happens. We then roll the credits. At the beginning of Sharknado 4, we we think she's dead through a lot of it. Um, she turns out to be alive, thinking that her family's dead, and there's all this backstory dealing with a coma, and just a lot of mystery and everything. And this is all stuff that if you're watching Sharknado 4, you're like, why does that kid think his mother is a shark? How did Tara Reid die? What's going on here? I don't understand. And there was just a lot of stuff like that, and they didn't even give hints to it in Sharknado 4. They just assumed you saw Sharknado 3. 
Right, and that was the problem. Yeah, well, that bugs me with uh, sequels because every movie should stand on its own. So even if they had to say one line to kind of let you know and not have to figure it out, you know, I guess you could probably figure out the Tara Reid stuff, not the exacts of what happened, yeah, but, you know, something happened. Yeah. But I'm not necessarily sure the, the, the kid thinking his mom's a shark ever is made clear. I think by the end I did figure out that I was missing some piece of the puzzle, but I was guessing that she was – there was an analogy made to Anakin Skywalker because she was dressed very Lady Vader-ish and she had mechanical parts – including an arm that turned into a lightsaber. So I thought maybe there was something about her coming back and her father, played by Gary Busey, who hasn't been this good since Celebrity Apprentice. You thought he was good? <laughs> I thought he was good. Oh, man, I thought yes. he was terrible. <laughs> I thought for what he had to do, he was he was good. Well, it, that that is the one thing about a performance like Gary Busey's. In a movie like this, that's the perfect kind of performance because – they gave him some acting bits on Celebrity Apprentice, and he was just terrible. Right. But, I mean, in a in a movie like this, you want bad acting because it's supposed to be, you know, reminiscent of those old B movies where the acting wasn't great anyway. Plus, they're making fun of themselves when they make this movie. And that's what's always kind of worked with the Sharknado movies is they know that they're not good movies. They know people are watching them to laugh at them. They don't think people are really going to be scared of Sharknados. At least I hope they don't think this. They think people are just going to sit back and have a good time laughing and having, a, you know, just laughing at all the things that are going on. And so you put bad performances in there and Gary Busey was terrible, but I think he probably worked real, but I think he worked really well with this film because of that. We were laughing at him. Skywalkers, who do you agree with me or Mark? Tweet at us at Skywalking Pod. Now, you got to remember with Gary Busey, a lot of people don't remember this, but he used to be a good actor when he was was doing Oscar nominated. Yeah. When he was doing stuff like. Well, Buddy that, Holly story? Yeah, he was Oscar nominated for Buddy Holly story, but he was also really good in Lethal Weapon. He was great in he, Lethal Weapon. He was really good in Point Break. Mm-hmm. You know, so he's he was a good actor. I don't know what happened. Maybe it was the motorcycle accident, but now he's just kind of out there. <laughs> well, know? yeah, he's very very much out he's, there. He's perfect for an asylum film, though, because he's he's bad, you know? Yeah, he had a great TV show on Comedy Central to the something to the effect of being with Gary Busey, where some fan really had an obsession with Gary, so he wrote a whole series around he and Gary Busey just hanging out, <laughs> and he was really good on that. But now let's let's talk about something you just touched on about how these actors are just having a good time with all of this, and they're not taking this seriously. Now, I can say that for most of the actors, and in a second we can go through all the cameos, but Ian Zerling. It looked like he thought this was going to be a film that was going to be in wide release in 52,000 theaters across the world. I didn't get the impression he was having a good time with this. I thought he was taking it way too seriously. I I don't think so. I think he's over the top with his serious nature. Like He's like playing it in a serious mode, but he's doing it over the top. I don't think that he feels that way at all. In all four Sharknado movies, there's only one actor that I ever thought took it serious. Gary Busey? No. No, if you ever see Sharknado 3, it has the kid from Malcolm in the Middle. Malcolm? Yes. Frankie Muniz (laughs) from Malcolm in the Middle. But I never really thought he was a great actor. I loved my dog Skip, which he's in. Yeah, great movie. But I never really thought he was a great actor. But there's something about his performance in Sharknado 3 where I was kind of like... Does he not know that he's in a because he was playing it really serious. He played it really serious, but he was good because of it, because he gets this really great death sequence that works because he seems to be taking it serious. But other than that, how did I miss Sharknado 3? I don't know. You need to go watch now. It is. If you like Sharknado 1, then you got to see Sharknado 3. Sharknado 2 is a good companion piece and it works with them, but it's not a great movie. Sharknado 1 and Sharknado 3 are the two that you need to see. Is Sharknado 2 the Beneath the Planet of the Apes of the franchise? No. Beneath wasn't as good as the other films? No, I think that, uh, I actually think that Sharknado 4 is probably the weakest of all of them. Sharknado 2 was kind of a sequel but it didn't seem like the filmmakers knew what they had in Sharknado 1 because 
Sharknado 1, I remember watching it. You, I was watching it with you, and we had a whole group of people, and we were just laughing at some of the insanity of it. And I remember when he reached in and grabbed the girl and pulled her out of the shark, somebody that was in our room, somebody that was in the room with us was like, he didn't just pull her out of that <laughs> shark. It was just, it, it reached this level of insanity that two kind of flatlined and never really tried to go over the top enough. It went over the top, but not as much as Sharknado 1. And I think they realized that because then they totally went over the top with Sharknado 3. But they did it in a really smart way, whereas Sharknado 4, it goes over the top in places, but none of it makes any sense. And it doesn't seem to work in the same way. I didn't really like Sharknado 4 very much. Well, the title doesn't make any sense, except that they want to pull people in like me that's thinking it's going to be a Star Wars parody. Right, well, it opens with the... the, It opens up with the opening crawl. Right. Which I thought, oh, oh, okay, we're in for a Force Awakens parody. Let's see what they do with this. But with the sharks, we we never got that. But there was a whole lot of Star Wars references, including Daniel Logan, who plays young Boba Fett in Attack of the Clones. And here he is playing Captain Fett, a (laughs) pilot, with a Boba Fett pilot helmet on that looked like it was made out of colored tape. (laughs) And... I was watching the helmet. I didn't even notice it was Daniel Logan. But after his scene was over, I thought, wait a minute. I know that he's in this film. Was that him? So I had to rewind it because my eyes were just drawn onto his helmet. And sure enough, there's our good buddy Daniel Logan as Captain Fett. So that's one of the Star Wars references. And there's a whole slew of of quotes, including when, when they're on the big pirate ship, which is the pirate ship outside of the Treasure Island Casino in Las Vegas. Now it's floating down Las Vegas Where Boulevard. Where did that flood come from? There's a flood in the middle of Vegas, and it looked like it was came from a building filled with water. Yeah, exactly. But how would that building have been big enough to create this size flood? I, I was there. I believed every <laughs> scene of that. But then here's Ian Zerling and uh, Bud Bundy. They're on the ship fighting like Jack Sparrow and the Orlando Bloom Kid, and Ian Zerling says, great kid, don't get cocky. I thought, okay, we'll we'll leave it right there. But I just don't like it when they, when films like this quote too many films, then it becomes a a quote fest. I got to tell you, I didn't like the cameos and I didn't like the quotes. Okay, there's another Star Wars reference I want to go to before we get to that. Now, in the end, when Ian Zerling had the the cross saber chainsaw sword, (laughs) I thought, okay, that's going to be great. I didn't even think of that as a reference towards... Oh, Kylo Ren's lightsaber. Now, I'm guessing this was shot in February. So it gives enough, enough lead time for the effects. Uh, so they had apparently had seen Force Awakens and knew what the crosssaber was. I was looking for some crosssaber Kylo Ren references, but... Nah, no. Right, but they might have stole that from the trailer and actually got it much true. earlier. If you're going to go that far, at least make it red. Or do a Finn and Kylo Ren battle reference something, but they just left it with the cross blades. Right, but I got the impression that they were trying to reference Excalibur. So maybe they were doing a cross of both. I can actually see where the Kylo Ren lightsaber references that you're talking about now, but to me it looked more like a uh, an Excalibur reference. So maybe they were trying to mix the two, and that's why it's all silver. Well, being the fourth awakens i'm sure that we're going for more of a star wars reference okay so there's two things that i want to talk about because i said earlier that there were two things i didn't like so i want to get your opinion on them and one was the constant use of quotes i hate that i i really don't like that it was too much yeah it goes way overboard it was just too much it was too in your face there was i didn't mind the fact that they were going to kansas because you know the whole wizard of oz and the tornado them going to kansas isn't as in your face as coming out right with those quotes of saying stuff like you're not in Kansas anymore, or the saw is family from Texas chainsaw massacre and stuff like that. They were just too many and they were too on, on the nose. And I also didn't like the cameos. They weren't as strong for some reason for me. And maybe it's because I saw the earlier ones and some of my favorite cameos were the ones where they didn't throw it in your face. Sort of like in Sharknado two, we had Judd Hirsch. And Judd Hirsch is in a lot of the movie. And to me, Judd Hirsch felt like Leslie Nielsen in Naked Gun. He's just totally out of place, and that's why he works. (laughs) But he's also a taxi driver. 
in the film. <laughs> but nowhere in the film do they ever look at him and say, you're a taxi driver. Or does he say, I'm a taxi driver? They just let him be a taxi driver. So the people who are, lo- you know, the people who love taxi will get it. And the people yeah. who don't, they're not like forcing it down your throat. Yeah, great and, inside joke. Yeah, and it's the same thing at the beginning of Sharknado 2 where there's a big scene on a airplane and the airplane's going down and being attacked by a Sharknado. And you cut inside the pilot's uh, cockpit and who do you see? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. No, Robert Hayes. Oh, 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 I was close. (laughs) I was was going with an airplane reference. You know, and they do make reference to the fish, eating the fish and stuff like that. But it never really, you know, it's never really somebody saying it to you. They just let it happen. But here, all the quotes just feel like they were in your face. And all the cameos almost felt wasted. Like the Judd Hirsch one in Sharknado 2, he's actually a character in the piece. I think I counted up to 40 guest cameos yeah, in but this. You watch Sharknado 3 and Mark Cuban's in it. Um, <laughs> because they're putting all the sharks from Shark Tank in all these movies. There's actually two in Sharknado 4 and they're totally wasted. You blink and you won't even see them. Well, what I like about that is, what's his name? Robert, last name I can't never pronounce. Hershevik? Yes, him. He and his a newly acquired wife, Kim Johnson, who was the really hot Australian dancer from Dancing with the Stars, who got married last weekend. Uh-huh. So she was the one who was his assistant. Right, but they barely used him. Like in Sharknado 3, Mark Cuban had a huge part. And the girl from Shark Tank, was it Lori Grenier? Yes. She didn't get very much time either. And to me, it was kind of like... What's the point of bringing these cameos in? Well, Tommy it's, Davidson it's the, gets a good part, but... It's the whole shark reference. And it was a good way to bring in Kim Johnson. I know, but I just wish they'd use them better. (laughs) I just wish they'd use them better the way that they use Judd Hirsch. When you watch a movie that is intentionally bad, and I have no doubt that these movies are intentionally bad, the director knows exactly what he's doing by making it as bad as he does. Well, the way he does that is to be smart by, on how bad he makes it. Does I that agree. make sense? Oh, yeah, I agree with that. And but I don't, I don't think, think they they're do that. trying to make it bad as much as this is the budget that we have. we got to work with this. But it didn't seem like there was any thought at all behind any of the badness of this well, film. I mean, the whole Sharknado scene in Vegas... My mind was wandering, and instead of being into the scene of sharks going all over the place, my mind was, don't I know that actress from somewhere? Well, you're right. With all the cameos and a lot of the... <laughs> I didn't like any of the A lot the cameos. of the cameo actors and actresses have aged about 20 years since I'd seen them last. Like <laughs> right. Adrian Zamed. Who, I didn't recognize him. He was in the casino before the Sharknado begins. And I'm like, who is that guy? Who... Oh, Adrian Samed from T.J. Hooker and Bachelor Party before he gets pierced through the heart by a swordfish. Worst cameo ever in a movie was the singer, the Vegas singer, lounge singer. Wayne Newton. Wayne Newton. There's the worst cameo I've ever seen in a movie. Well, they, they just stuck him up against a red curtain. They didn't even try to do <laughs> and anything And said, hey, sing the, I know you, have, you only have three minutes to do this scene, but sing the song. We'll have the cue cards up above the camera because <laughs> you can see his eyes going back and forth. I don't even think he got to get eaten. <laughs> like most of the cameos at least get to get eaten. <laughs> so I like Bud Bundy, David David Faustino. Right. Who, I'm not sure what happened to his character. And I'm not sure anybody would probably recognize him anymore. No, not at all. <laughs> Stacey Dash from Clueless. She was the Chicago mayor. She, I think, lands the worst joke in the whole movie when the house lands on her. And she's wearing these black and white Oh, I hated stockings. that joke. I like, hated that joke. But the whole setup with her, she's wearing these black and white stockings. And I'm thinking, why... She's a new. She's a Chicago mayor. Why is she wearing these black and white stockings? So it really took me out of it. <laughs> just so you could do the whole house witch, lands on house her. lands on her and her feet curl up up inside the house. It's crazy, and I didn't even understand her character because all her character was there to do was blame Finn, but it never had any payoff. Like it was Finn's fault that these Sharknados were appearing, but there was never any payoff to that. No, yeah, she got like mo- another spoiler. Most of the characters got killed. And there was no payoff to the characters getting killed. Like, these very central characters that were married to other characters, they'd be eaten by a shark. <laughs> and there was no remorse. No, like, dang, she was my wife. Or, oh, I can't <laughs> believe it. Did you see what just happened? There was nothing. Nothing right. to that. But I do love the fact that Carrot Top is the Uber driver. <laughs> and he gets immediately killed. <laughs> killed. But Godfried is one of the Today Show reporters. I liked him. Okay, I, I couldn't think of a cameo that I liked, but I did like him. I did not like how 
they kept coming up with different names for the tornadoes because it wasn't just shark nados. It right, was boulder nados. I got a list here. There's boulder nado, oil nado, sand nado, fire nado, lightning nado, lava nado, hail nado, and my favorite cow nado. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't like that they kept coming up with these. But Gilbert Gottfried at least made them work whenever he would list them off. <laughs> he w- I did like Gilbert Gottfried in in the film. So I, he would be my favorite cameo, and Wayne Newton would be my least favorite. And uh, maybe the cows from Twister, because that's basically what they were playing on <laughs> with the cow NATO. <laughs> and I, I got to say, I really loved Paul Schaefer's cameo. Yeah, I didn't like the Paul Schaefer. And he had a, a sign that said, out of work. <laughs> Come on, that's funny. <laughs> That's that's hilarious. Uh, you know, there's so much going on. I don't think I saw Wait, the those sign. Of, those Skywalkers out there who are just too young. Paul Schaefer was the musical director for David Letterman, and since Dave Letterman retired last year, he's out of work. Now he's a street <laughs> performer in Vegas. Uh, no, I, I I didn't like the cameos very much, and also I didn't like any of the action scenes because that was another thing about the first three movies: is the action scenes with the shark were always really ridiculous. But here. They just didn't seem to make a lot of sense. They're hanging from a crane, and there's a car on top of the crane for some <laughs> reason. And uh, and they climb into the car on top of the crane rather than trying to climb down the crane. And just a lot of stuff like that just didn't seem to make any sense to me. I didn't know how these shark nados were moving from state to state as they were. That's oh, no, something. they just get you you just to believe that, you know, in the middle of the desert, there's a shark nado building up. But this would be a sand nado. Yeah, but there were sharks in it. A sand shark nado. I think Al Roker even said, wait a minute, no, no, that would be a sand shark nado. <laughs> Al Roker was pretty good too, but he's in all of them, so I don't yeah. know if you really consider him a cameo. The fact that they used the Today Show as the leading correspondent for the news for the shark nados, I thought, wow, how much did they pay to the Today Show? Or was it one of these, hey, you use some of our anchors because they want to get some acting roles and you can use our show i'm not sure what kind of a deal went down there but i'd well, love to know well the production company is the asylum and they don't spend money on anything if you've ever seen any other films right so i'm i'm very eager to know how that went down because i'm sure to use something like the today show is not going to be cheap so i'm sure there was some kind of bartering going on i found it interesting that they only used two of them you'll notice that matt lauer was gone and the other girl was gone because in the third one, all four of them were there. But at the very end, they all get attacked by sharks. So I guess these are the two survivors. <laughs> all right. So now, what is your recap on Sharknado 4? Should people see this film? Uh, you know, I don't think they should. I don't I don't like it very much. And I'm going to preface this because a lot of people will think, oh, you know, he's giving a review. He's trying to be a critic um, or he is a critic because I do reviews for Adventures by Daddy and I have my own website coming out soon. Um, and they're going to think, oh, he can't give a good review to a movie like this because a lot of the critics are hard on movies like this and people think they don't get it. But I love the first movie and I like the second one and I love the third movie. I wouldn't give them, you know, like five star ratings. But they're fun, and sometimes it's okay for a movie to be bad as long as you have a good time watching it. If you have a good time watching it, who cares? You're having fun. I didn't have fun with Sharknado 4. I thought it was kind of a mess. I thought that they maybe ran out of ideas, and now they were just kind of throwing things out there. And maybe that's why the cameos were so quick, because they didn't really know what to do with them anymore. And I might be wrong here, but I think there were a lot more cameos in this one. Yeah. And I just wish they had used less cameos and gave them more to do because, like I said earlier, Mark Cuban had a bigger role in Sharknado 3. Well, pretty much um, if you go through the, the cast list of every reality show in the last four years, <laughs> that makes up the cast of Sharknado 4. Right. But, I mean, you watch Sharknado 3 and you watch the Mark Cuban character. He's got like five or six minutes in it. He's like an actual character. And Frankie Muniz in uh, Sharknado 3, he's probably got – five, seven minutes worth of screen time, but he's an actual character. Same thing with Judd Hirsch and Sharknado 2. I wish they do that with the cameos. I don't mind every once in a while giving, you know, little 30-second cameos, but it seemed like all the cameos weren't really being given enough to do, so they felt wasted. Too many things that were on the nose with all those quotes. I got tired of the quotes. That was the worst part of it. One thing I can definitely say is the special effects were a billion times better in Sharknado 4 than they were in the first Sharknado. 
but I thought they did a, a good job in in marrying the elements together. It looked better. It looked like they maybe had more money to do it. Right. Yeah. Right. I just want to know. Finally, maybe have somebody answer this question for me. I guess maybe it makes no sense since Sharknadoes can now form in the desert. But I always wanted to know how come the tornadoes were able to pull the sharks up into them, but we never saw any octopus or whale. Or, <laughs> it's like it was the tornadoes were. S- selectively choosing who they pulled up into them but that's the stupidity of the sh- of the series of movies well i think if they had gone with the whole force awakens parody they could have gotten so much more out of it but that would have cost another couple of bucks right well you know it could be a little more interesting as they move forward to kind of do that kind of thing because the very beginning of sharknado 3 starts off like a james bond film You know, instead of looking down the barrel of a gun, you're looking through the mouth of a shark. You know, as it does the thing that the, you know, the barrel of the gun does at the beginning of James Bond. And uh, so maybe if they started parodying genres with this whole Sharknado thing, it might be a little bit more interesting rather than just trying to repeat what they think was successful in the the one before. And maybe that's what happened with 4. Right, right. And what I didn't understand mostly about this was that it had been five years since the last shark NATO attack, but yet the whole world is now shark happy. Even as far as to theme this whole Vegas hotel into shark world. I don't know if they were shark happy. They oh, were shark free. There, there were more shark toys around. There was the the whole the whole hotel was based on the fact that sh- people were shark happy. Yeah, but I think the hotel was based on the idea of sharks because. That was that hotel was owned by the Tommy Davidson character, who was the guy who built this elaborate system that got rid of the Sharknados. Right, but these these sharks caused a lot of destruction. Like you wouldn't expect Disneyland to build up a crocodile <laughs> hotel after but, what had happened. But how shark happy were the people on that day? That seemed like it was supposedly opening day. How many people were really there? And only one beautiful woman runs up to him, all excited to see him. Well, Adrian, <laughs> and then as you're as as Adrian uh, Zamed was there, as uh, as you're looking out over the crowd, and then we go into the car with uh, with Finn. And Carrot Top, and they're driving down the streets. There's no other cars in play at the hotel. There's no people in the background. It's like an empty Vegas. So maybe they weren't shark happy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they were all at the buffet at that point. Right. What were they eating, though? Seafood? (laughs) Oh, you went there, didn't you? Hey, you know what? Let's read a couple of reviews that I had found to see if, if you agree with what people have to say. I found this on RogerEbert.com. And they say, the good news about Sharknado 4, The Fourth Awakens, the latest in the frighteningly durable cable movie franchise that began in 2013 with the original Sharknado, that it's nowhere near the worst of the unnecessary sequels this summer. All right, do you agree with that? (laughs) I don't know if I agree with that. We had some pretty bad sequels this summer, like Independence Day Resurgence. Hey, I like that. So I don't know if it's the worst of the sequels, Maybe it is the worst of the sequels, just because it wasn't on that level. Like, at least with Independence Day, the effects were just amazing. One thing with Sharknado films, people love these films. There's a big contingency of bad movie lovers who this one- just love to gather around and watch another Sharknado movie. All right, now, the Colorado Springs Gazette. They say Colorado Springs Gazette, the Colorado Springs Gazette. They say it knows exactly what it is and makes no apologies for it. Although the series is starting to show its age, The Fourth Awakens still delivers over-the-top summer nonsense. I love that. It makes no apologies. And it doesn't. No, it, it is what it is. No, it doesn't. And, but I don't think it knows what it is. If you were to say that about the third one or the first one, I'd say, yes, I agree with that. But I am not necessarily sure the filmmakers did know what, what this one was. Because it, it didn't feel like they they were going for anything with this one. Well, Whereas with building, three, it felt like they were going to something. Well, like we had said earlier, it's it's building off of three. So I think they do have a game plan. And at the end of the day, let's just get a tornado, throw some sharks in there, and get Ian Zerling with a, with a, with a snarl on his face, and we get a film. I don't know. This one felt like it was rushed out. It, it just didn't have the appeal that the other ones had. So I don't know that they knew that what they had here. Whereas like if you were that same comment, if you were to make that about Sharknado 3... 
I'd, ag- I'd agree with it. Okay. Well, I didn't say that. I said that they make no apologies for it. It is what it is. We're not going to apologize for the fact that there's a sand NATO and a lightning NATO and a lava NATO and a cow NATO. <laughs> I haven't met the filmmaker, so I don't know. Maybe they are making apologies going, oh, they made me do this. Sci-Fi Channel made me do this. Now, the rap.com, they say a joke might be funny the first time, but by the fourth time <laughs> you hear it, the punchline gets tired. Tired is a good description for Sharknado 4, The Fourth Awakens, although this film is as absurd and silly as the first three installments. This time around, the whole thing feels forced. <laughs> I, I agree with that, with the exception of the fact that he says that it's as silly. And I think that's my problem, is it's not as silly. Well, let's focus on the fact that people keep saying that this is a tired joke. Are we done with Sharknado movies? You know, I don't know. I'd have to wait to see the next one, but I think they're done. I think they've run out of ideas. I thought they were done with two, though, which was only a good film as opposed to, you know, going a, going insane the way the first one did. But then three came along and I was kind of like, well, but I like this. So this feels like they're done. But who knows? Maybe they can come up with something for the next one. But they really got to come up with something before they make it. <laughs> well, first comes the title. Then comes the movie. <laughs> now, lastly, we have... I, I, I heard an interview with Roger Corman where he talked about uh, making movies today in this kind of world. And he was talking about how first they come up with the most insane title. He was actually saying that, that, oh, no, they come up with the title first. And then they say, can you make a movie called Super Croc? And he's like, yeah, sure. And then they just make the movie based on the title. Well, just like a sausage party that's coming out <laughs> another week. Yeah, I'm You not... know they had the title first. Uh, yeah. I don't know what to think of that. I haven't seen it, though. I try to have an open mind before I watch a movie. Lastly, the Boston Herald, my hometown. They say, this franchise finally jumps the Sharknado. (laughs) I don't know if that's meant in a good way or a bad way. (laughs) I think a little bit of both. I think maybe they're referring to the fact that they're trying to tie into something as big as Star Wars. That's for them. By making a Happy Days reference? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I think a lot of people don't even know that's a Happy Days reference anymore. They just know that jumping the shark means, okay, they're doing some kind of silly plot device to get more people in to see this film. And I think naming it The Fourth Awakens is jumping the Sharknado. I, I don't understand. Is finally You're I, looking at it too literally. I guess. <laughs> I guess. And we're talking about Sharknado, and I'm trying to make sense. You're trying to look way too deeply (laughs) into this. All right. So let's wrap this up by saying Sharknado 4, The Fourth Awakens, premiered on July the 31st, which was just a couple of days ago. But I'm sure there's going to be plenty of repeat viewings. And for those of you Star Wars fans, just tune into the first 10 minutes to see Daniel Logan's cameo as Captain Fett. All right, Mark, thanks for coming on, and I guess we'll talk to you for Sharknado 5. I have no idea what they're going to call it, but I don't think they're going to reference Star Wars. Maybe they'll reference Star Trek or something. Not likely they're going to reference the same thing twice. No. Especially since people will now know that that reference doesn't mean anything, except for show me the money. (laughs) Well, there you go. Sharknado meets Jerry Maguire, show me the money. All right, there you go. Thanks a lot, Mark. Anytime. And remember, never land. And a shark needle. <laughs> well, that wraps up episode 131 of Skywalking Sky Through, Through Neverland. Neverland. We want to give a big thank you to Jedi Schwa and Shaz Bazaar from Techno Retro Dads and Marco Gushiewicz from Talking Apes TV, all for joining us on our discussions today on Howard the Duck and Sharknado. Wow. <laughs> all right, now. We have a little bit of bad news regarding meetups. Yeah, I know a couple episodes ago we said we were going to be at the Friends of the Magic meetup, which happens this weekend at Disneyland, but we got really busy. Yeah, they And we're got... not really able to make it. Perhaps we'll make an appearance, but we're not hosting a, uh, a, ride. a, a ride or anything like that, an experience at the Friends of the Magic meetup. But if you are going to this meetup this weekend, let us know when you're going to be there. And yeah, we'll try we to make... If we can pop over for a little right. bit, we will, but... Uh, yeah, summer... probably probably not Saturday, but... Summertime is just such a hard time to schedule anything. It's true. It's true. So, so Skywalker, sorry about that if, if you were planning on seeing us, but we might pop by one of us or two of us, or yeah, we'll so see. Once again, let us know when you're going to be there so we can do some kind of a meetup. Yes. All right. 
I almost didn't want to say that, but oh. I know. Then, then it becomes a reality. But I do want to remind Skywalkers that in 2017, we are doing a five-night Skywalking Disney cruise, which you can join us on. And that is September 17th through 22nd, 2017. Just so you know, because I know September's coming up, but it's next year. And it's a five-night Disney cruise to Baja, Mexico on the Disney Wonder, which it was just announced this week is getting the new Frozen show. So that's exciting. So to get more info and to see if you want to join us, head to storiesofthemagic.com slash cruise quote and click on the orange get a quote button in the upper left to get a free, no obligation quote, learn a little more information. You're not committing in anything. You're just getting more information. So, uh, and it's going to be super exciting. The more people who come, the more interesting things we can do. We can podcast on the cruise, oh, you know, yeah. all kinds of fun things. So if one person tells us we can't podcast on the cruise, <laughs> I'm going to flip out. Secret Squirrel's going to follow in us. In fact, we're supposed to be talking to our Skywalking through Neverland lawyer tonight. Oh. Just to get the... Get the real deal on oh. what's going on with Disney saying you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't periscope, you can't walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> I want to know what the real deal is so next time Secret Squirrel says we can't do something, I can say, well, let's sit down there, Secret. Let's have a chat. Ah, uh, with we my can, lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> we can back it up with facts. Nice. All right, now, everyone, Rob Dellinger is about to finish up his awesome Jingle Mix Volume 1. So if you want to do a jingle and have it included on this awesome album, now's the time. Now, today, once again, is August the 3rd, and I think you have another two weeks. Really? I thought people were supposed to have an in by August 1st. Yeah, but then Rob went on vacation and moved oh, okay. everything back. Gotcha. Yeah, so if you want to do this, and I, I encourage you to do it because it's a lot of fun, please... Record yourself singing a Rob Dellinger jingle and send it into share at skywalkingthroughneverland.com. And once again, what we're going to do is we're going to take all these jingles that you guys sent in and you're going to mix them all together just into one big super jingle. One big bonus track. Yeah. It'll be super exciting. So Sarah and I are going to be on it. We already have a whole bunch of other people and we want to make sure that everyone's included on, on this album. Absolutely. So much fun. Speaking of being included, we are part of the RetroZap.com Resistance Network of Podcasts, which they just did a fun uh, rejigger of the website over there. So if you head to RetroZap.com, it looks different. It looks pretty. It's awesome. And you can find other awesome shows like Brews and Blasters. Techno Retro Dads. The Deuce Cast Movie Show. And Talking Apes TV. Oh, and also Blob of the Hut, which just put out their live episode from Star Wars Celebration Europe, and it was quite fun. They talked to people from Skellig Michael, nope. who actually run nope. Skellig Michael, like the tours, so it was really interesting. Cool. Yeah. All right, Skywalkers. Well, if you want to join us during the week, we are always open for business on social media. So we are at Skywalking Pod for Twitter, Instagram, Periscope, and Snapchat. Just, just don't do it at Disneyland because apparently they don't let you Snapchat at <laughs> Disneyland anymore. That's right. And we also have our Facebook group. And if you want to join us over there, we have a fun, awesome group going on. It is a closed group on Facebook. So just search Skywalking Through Neverland group. You should find it. You can request to join. But then if you are requesting, please also send a little message to our Skywalking Through Neverland Facebook page and say, hey, I'm not a bot. I want to join the group. All right? We're keeping it nice and clean and family-friendly over there. All right, everyone. That'll wrap things up. So remember, never, never land, land on, on Duck World. Never land on Alderaan. To our Skywalkers and Tweetwalkers, thanks for listening. Skywalking Through Neverland is created and produced by Richard and Sarah Woloski. Original music by Rob Dellinger. Creative consultant, Mark Ogushwitz. Technical advisor, Peter Heitman. Facebook administrators, Donald Wicks, Joey Pittman, and Norma Heitman. Skywalking Through Neverland is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Any sounds, music, and clips played during this podcast are the property of their copyright holders. All original content is property of Skywalking Through Neverland, all rights reserved. Sorry, had to be said.
This is what you can look forward to on episode 131 of Skywalking Through Neverland. Should I say that again? Yeah. This is what you can look forward to on a ducktastic episode of one... Bleh. Okay. <laughs> Beep, beep. Exactly. <laughs> hey, hey, beep. Skywalkers, one more time. And here we go. <coughs> oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> but they made references to the... To the <clears throat> Revenge of the shark, fifth. Revenge of the fifth shark. Revenge... The fourth awakens. Revenge of the fifth shark. Never, Never land, land on, on Duck, Duck World. World. <laughs> That didn't come across together. <laughs> Do you want to just say that last part? All right. Now we go from ducks to sharks. Wait a minute. Weren't those rivals in West Side Story? They were. They were. Oh, no. That was the Jets. The no, Jets no, and no, the no, Sharks. No, no, no. It was the Ducks and the Sharks. <laughs> oh, well, Richard. Wait, hold on. Yes. No, you're right. You're right. It was the uh, Sharks and the Jets. Okay. Yes. Okay. Shark- My Shark- bad. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was the, the ducks. <laughs> That's okay. Well, you didn't need to know that to watch Sharknado. So Richard and his Talking Apes TV co-host, Mark Ogoshowitz, they review the greatest... Oh, they review the greatest shark film. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. It starred an Ewok. I mean, I mean, Leah Thompson. One more time. It starred Leah Thompson. So that is what you need to know for our big Howard the Duck discussion. Consider yourself edumacated. Consider yourself edumacated. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> Try again. Edumacated? Edu- it's not working. <laughs> Consider yourself eguated. Oh, egg- <laughs> <laughs> that's the best we can do. All right, stay tuned. All right, cool. All right, there, should Skywalkers. We, should we say goodbye to the Skywalkers? Uh, I don't know, Skywalkers. Do you want to hear more? We have what? Do you want to know outs? more? Okay, who, who who got that reference? Do you want to know more? Oh, by the way, Wait, jo- hold on. Let's see if we get that reference. Well, Joey Pittman was saying. That we should say, you, you, you ought to know. <laughs> you can That's, do that. I'm, I should do it I'm, as I'm a Lannis Morissette. Yeah. Which is awesome. <laughs> oh, oh, who got that? Halstead 8. Oh, Starship Troopers. Yay! <laughs> I didn't get it. Well, that wraps up episode 131 of Skywalking Through, Through Neverland. Neverland. We want to thank Jedi Schwa. Shaz Bazaar. And Marco Gushowitz from Talking Apes TV. Let's do that one more time. Yeah, no, you, the show. you do all of yeah. this because okay. then I do stuff later. Yup, yup. I'm sorry. Or in a Sharknado. Never land with Ewoks. <laughs> They'll eat you up. I don't know. There you go. All right, everyone. There you have it. There you go. <laughs> uh, what, is, what does he say? <laughs>